Lord, I thank you that we can come before you, almighty, infinite God, the one who has spoken everything into creation and the one who so loved this world and the people in it that you sent your only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for what you did for each one of us, for every person who would call on your name, who would confess you as Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, that we have eternal life. We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who is above all earthly kings, all earthly powers, the one alone, true God. And so, Lord, we've come to worship you this morning. I pray, God, that you'll loosen our tongues, that we would praise you, that you'll open our hearts and open our minds, that we would receive your word, and that uh, you would um, take our rebellious wills and subdue them, God, that as we walk out of this place, not only will we have been changed more into the image and likeness of Christ, but that we will be committed to living out your word this coming week. It's in Jesus' name we've gathered, in his name that we pray, and together we say, Amen. Well, let's worship together. Sign 
this next song is an invitation. If you're weary, if you're tired, to come before Jesus. If you're a sinner, come before him. given him the name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Calling on the name of Jesus brings healing, deliverance, joy, peace, hope, and salvation. 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom over fear and all anxiety. Yes. To every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. As I was working on this communion, I was reminded of the prophet Elijah's contest with the prophet of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. The prophet of Baal prepared their sacrifice and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leap about the altar which they had made, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry louder. He's a God. Maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's busy. Or maybe he's traveling. Or maybe he's sleeping, and you got to wake him up. So they cried aloud and cut themselves with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Most of us know this story. The prophet Elijah called on the name of God, and the Lord sent fire from heaven that devoured Elijah's sacrifice and everything around it. Before Jesus taught his disciple the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> he said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the thing you have need of before you ask him. And before Jesus taught us about building our house on the rock in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, he said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? The instruction for the Lord's Supper that we find in 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> we are commanded to examine ourselves. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by, by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Before we partake of the elements, let's take a few quiet moments. Examine our hearts Search our conscience. Ask ourselves these questions. When I call on the mighty name of Jesus, am I using meaningless repetitions like the unbelievers? When I speak that mighty holy name of Jesus, am I being obedient to do the things that Jesus wants me to do? Let's bow our heads. Ask the Lord to reveal things that you and I need to repent of. Ask God for forgiveness. Let's bow our heads now. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the remembrance of Jesus' broken body. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till it comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just want to thank you so much, God, for the privilege of worship. Thank you, God, for your amazing love in sending your son, Jesus, to bring us salvation and eternal life. Lord, this morning, we want to lift up our senior pastor, Pastor Layton, and, and Jenny, Lord God. You know, we just pray, God, you know, for, you know, for strength, for guidance and wisdom for Pastor Layton, you know, as he goes through this uh, difficult time, Lord God, of caring for Jenny. And in the name of Jesus, we ask for your healing touch for Jenny. Oh, Lord God, you know, strengthen her physically, spiritually, Lord God, you know, strengthen her immune system. And Lord God, please give her your healing touch in Jesus' name. From Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 14. <clears throat> Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kind of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, that it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for our services this morning. Thank you, Lord God, you know, for allowing us to raise our voice and in music, you know, to sing praises to your holy name, God. You know, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate communion, Lord, and to witness water baptism. Lord, now as you're going to turn to your word, you know, I ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The passage of scripture we just read, Jesus laid down the fundamental principle of his kingdom. He also set the expectation for the citizens of that kingdom. If we claim to be his followers, disciples, and members of God's family, we are expected to be salt and light. Our heavenly father should be glorified through our lives of good works. Question, are you a citizen of God's kingdom? If you are, say amen. amen. Okay. This message was supposed to be the last Advent series that I was originally scheduled to share on December 17th last year. <clears throat> However, a few days after I came back from Africa, I tested positive for COVID and so have to self-quarantine for six days. And I did share this message at the 7 a.m. service on New Year's Eve. So if you're hearing this for the second time, enjoy your double blessings. <laughs> this time of the year, we usually hear a lot about New Year's resolution. What are we looking forward to for the rest of this year? As followers of Christ, the most important question we should be asking ourselves are, number one, 
what should my plan be this year to further the kingdom of God and the cause of Jesus Christ? Number two, what do I need to do to be salt and light for Christ in my community? Number three, what good works can I do in 2024 that will bring glory to my Father in heaven? So forget New Year's resolution. I'm sure many of us have already forgotten anyway. Instead, let's pray, plan, and make a commitment to expand the kingdom of God this year and beyond. Remember, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Amen? Amen. So don't be surprised if God bless your finance, improves your health, restores your broken relationship. Don't be shocked if he makes you more loving and patient as you continue to be salt and light for Christ. See, whether it's January or June or November, let us never forget our greatest Christmas present, Jesus. The greatest and most meaningful life is sharing Christ in obedience to the Great Commission, leaving out the greatest commandment by being salt and light to the world. Every day, I think, should be Christmas. Do you agree with me on that? Yes. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible talks a lot about light, from Genesis to Revelation. God's first act of creation is to bring light out of darkness. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Light represents the kingdom of God and darkness the kingdom of Satan. The Lord used light to separate his people from the kingdom of darkness. We read in Exodus 10.23 that God brought total darkness to the Egyptians for three days. But all the children of Israel, the Bible says, had light in their dwellings. On their journey, the Lord went before them by day in the pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in the pillar of fire to give them light. Light exposes the evildoers and their work of darkness. Job 24 says, They are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways, nor abide in its path. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy, and in the night he's like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. They do not know the light. For the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. Jesus said, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deed may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Is my life and your life reveals the light of Christ? Is a lamp not to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Jesus is our light. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have been transformed by the light of Christ. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
God called us out of darkness. Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter, 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As God's people, we are to walk in the light of Christ, exemplifying his love. Because if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. There is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going. Jesus promised us everlasting light from here to eternity. Revelation 22.5 says, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. His light is the cure for our fear. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Are you shining the light of Christ in your life? Now let's talk about salt. There are four functions of salt. There are probably more. I'm just going to talk about four. First of all, salt is a preservative. Second, salt is a flavor enhancer. Third, salt is the key ingredient in worship and sacrifice offering, as we read in the Old Testament. Fourth, salt purifies. Salt prevents food from spoilage, especially meat from rotting. As believers, our life should preserve the world from the rottenness of sin and all its ill effects. Preventing our world from being completely overtaken by the evil inherent in the world dominated by ungodly and redeemed people corrupted by sin. When Jesus said we are the salt or the preservative of the earth, he's telling us that our godly lives are the seasoning that preserves and perpetuates the truth of the gospel message as well as the goodness in society. Second function of salt is to enhance flavor in food, to give food its taste. Job 6.6 6 says, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? As salt enhances the flavor of the food it season, you and I should stand out as those who enhance the flavor of life in our communities. Living our life in obedience to Christ and his word under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, will inevitably influence the world for good. We are to be peacemakers where there is conflict. Bring comfort to the sorrowful, encouragement to the down and out. Where there is hatred, we are to show the love of God in Christ through mercy, forgiveness, and not returning evil for evil. We don't need a lot of salt to improve flavor. So even though we will never be a majority in this world, but if we live godly life, we will have great influence for good in our communities. Just a few salty Christians will invite others to taste and see that the Lord is good, as it says in Psalm 34, 8. Third, salt is an essential ingredient of worship and sacrifice offering. In Exodus 30, when God commanded Moses to make that exclusive incense for the holy temple, he said to take equal amount of spices and you shall make of this an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. Leviticus 2.13 Every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offering you shall offer salt. For animal sacrifice. We read in Ezekiel 43 verse 24. 
When you offer them before the Lord, the priest shall throw salt on them, and they will offer them up as a burnt offering to the Lord. Fourth, salt is a purifier. In 2 Kings chapter 2, the prophet Elisha was told, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant, but the water is bad and the ground barren. Elisha said, bring me a bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast the salt in there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it, there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains sealed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. When God pronounced judgment on Jerusalem, he said to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abomination and say, On the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in the water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt. As salt for Jesus, we are to be all four of these things. We are to be the seasoning that draws out what is good. We are to be the preservative that keeps what is good to stay good. And we are to be an ingredient in the altar of incense. Our life ought to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. As the Holy Spirit put us through God's sanctifying process, people close to us are also being purified by the truth of God and by the godly life that we live. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth, inward and outward. The Bible says, For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Jesus said, Salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourself and have peace with God. Mark 9, verse 45 and 50. And the Bible says in Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now, last Sunday in my mission report, I mentioned a few servants of God in West Africa who are pouring out their life as salt of the earth and illuminating their world with the light of Christ day in and day out. So I want you to meet them this morning. Please, uh, this is uh, Pastor Didier and uh, Helen and their team. They have been training children through puppets to reach other children with the gospel. Through their programs in churches, in Christian ministries, in schools and parks and rec center, they have trained thousands of children who are now reaching out to other children with the gospel. In many countries in the world today, it's very difficult to reach the adults with the gospel. But when you reach the children, this ministry is actually raising up the next generation of children in this ungodly country. Next. And uh, this is a uh, ministry is called Arena. It's led by Dr. Itengre and his wife. Dr. Itengre is a surgeon. He has been director of hospitals in Africa. Served with mercy ship, gave up his highly respected position and comfortable life to care for thousands of destitute, outcast, and suffering women in his own country and the surrounding conflict area. Dr. Itengre and his team of surgeons, doctors, and nurses have successfully performed over 9,000 surgeries, turning women and their families, even whole villages, to Christ. You know, these are the women, their husband and their children, you know, that are waiting for treatment. So Dr. Itengre and his ministry, 
give them housing and food and take care of them while they're waiting for treatment. Amazing ministry. Next. The lady you said the far end there in blue, her name is Kate Lord. She's 60 some years old young when she started this ministry. Kate is from England. Her previous occupation was a show horse trainer. She and her team of locals ministered to boys, the worst of the worst. Boys that have been forced to beg and steal by the religious leaders in exchange for religious instruction, food, and lodging. Failure to meet their daily quota result in denial of meals and even beatings. Kate and her team bring these wild boys in several times a week for three to four hours for Bible stories, scripture memorization, a meal, and time to play. And many, you know, have received Christ. You know, if you want to get a closer look of Kate, she's the one sitting right across from me there on the picture. I can go to the next slide. This is Mark Collier. Mark is from Northern Ireland. His previous occupation, geologist for oil company, made lots of money. Now, working for the kingdom of God, not drilling oil to enrich the rich, but drilling pure and clean water for the poor in this dry, thirsty land of West Africa. Amen. Praise God. Yes. <clears throat> Mark and his team had drilled over 500 wells in Christian churches, ministries, and Christian schools. These ministries share their clean water with their community. Over 500,000 people, that's over half a million folks, are enjoying pure, clean, artesian water springing from some 300 feet underground every single day. This is a very powerful and enduring testimony for Christ. Thousands have become Christian. You know, churches have grown in attendance by leaps and bounds, and many are being drawn to Christ daily as they come and get water. Next. And, uh, you know, the lady on your far left, she's our own Fina Linen from Bay Area, gave up career in ID to be part of Wycliffe Bible Translator, creating software to translate the Bible from English and French to tribal languages. A few years ago, the Lord directed her to children's ministry. Fina has trained local faithful Christian teacher and staff to effectively minister to children in two different locations. Hundreds of very poor, many unschooled children are now hearing the gospel, learning about Jesus, and experiencing the love of God daily. Praise God for that. Some of the gathering, there's over 200 kids when we were there. You know, and again, as I shared last week, these people are doing this, even in this condition, this environment that they're in. You can put the next slide, please. <clears throat> you, you know, you've heard me share that last week. See, folks, God loves us so much that he gave us his greatest gift, his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through him, we have eternal life peace with God, forgiveness of sins, adoption into God's family. Jesus is the greatest gift anyone could ever receive. Jesus is too precious for you and for me to hide and keep to ourselves. We must share Jesus and what he has done in our lives. If you, by the grace of God, received Christ, share this greatest news in obedience to Jesus' commands to be salt and light. 
if you don't have that desire, it's possible that you never receive Jesus Christ as your greatest gift. I'm thankful that here at Church of the Highland, we decided to emphasize prayer in 2024. <clears throat> because prayer is essential as we endeavor to be salt and light. As Pastor Ted and Pastor Dave have shared the team, pray more in 24 for the last two weeks. Let us pray more. Pray the prayer of faith. James 15, 14 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elder of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Prayer that is followed with action. Because the Bible says that faith without action is not faith. If you're sick, yes, please pray. But don't just pray. Act. Do something. Go to your pastor, your elder, your friends, your family. Ask them to pray for you. Go to the doctor. Get medical treatment. Every day. When I wake up, I thank God for keeping me healthy most of my life. But several years ago when I fractured my wrist, yes, I did pray for healing. But I thought, well, nothing to it. I'll recover. That was my attitude. But I thank God for my wife who insisted on taking me to the emergency room. Most recently, my blood test result alarmed my doctor. He was so alarmed that he set me up for a biopsy appointment. Did I pray? Of course I pray. And for a while there, I felt fine. I really was thinking about canceling the appointment. But praise God, God didn't let me cancel the appointment. A few days ago, I got an email from my doctor. It says, Fantastic news, Mr. Lolong. No cancer. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> God be the glory. <clears throat> Pray the prayer of faith and act in faith. James 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Does also faith by itself, if it does not have work, is dead. See, the devil will put up many roadblocks to stop us from praying to God, but it will do everything in its power to stop us from taking action on what we prayed for. Let me repeat that. The devil will put up many roadblocks to stop us from praying to God, but it will do everything in his power to stop us from taking action on what we prayed for. So as you live today, go turn on your light and pour out your salt that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Let me close with this word from Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nation, his wonders among all people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word, Lord God. Your word is power. Your word is truth, Lord God. Lord, help us to go out each and every day and proclaim your truth. Proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to live our life sharing your love with others and sharing the good news of the gospel. Amen. God bless you abundantly. 
in 2024 as you go share Jesus. <laughs>